Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome all of you in the Palace of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. We gathered here for the open session of the report of by IAZAC, the European Academy Science Advisory Council, about the very concerned chemical compound group of neonicotinoid. This is the report. Everybody, all of you, could get a free copy after the session outside of the room. The session is organized by the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, the IASAC, and the Academia Europea Budapest Knowledge Group. I would like to welcome our honorable panelists and the audience, and I would like to introduce myself as the moderator of the session. My name is Istvan Paludjai, I am science journalist. Before to ask the first speaker, I would like to present the possibility to contribute to the roundtable discussion. The members of the audience in the room would be able to use the mobile microphones. The people who follow our online broadcast, they could take the questions uh, through the YouTube chat. What I will listen after and, and read the questions. Please take all your questions with your name and affiliation. Now I would like to invite first Professor George Kostolányi, Vice President of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, to make the opening address to the meeting. <coughs> then immediately after, Professor Lars Wallow, Chair of the IASAC Environmental Steering Panel, to give the first presentation about the process of the IASAC report preparation. Thank you. Dear friends here in person and in the online distance, it is a pleasure for me to greet you again in uh, this uh, excellent uh, ESOC uh, organization. And I hope that we learned a lot from this, this morning. To begin, uh, I am not an expert, but I am a strong believer in science and the scientific analysis in our life, thanks to the technological development, we learned a lot in the last uh, years, last decades, from our environment, for our nature, from the human being. But occasionally I feel that the huge number of data embarrassing. How can we be oriented to uh, understand to use the implement of data. I think that uh, the science occasionally need some new paradigm to be oriented. I, I recommend uh, now for this session the uh, complex system paradigm. Complex system is a system with various components which uh, may interact each other to conclude for a uh, consensus about the nature and the field what, uh, about the, this data is concerned. The study of complex system is an approach to investigate the components, how they interact each other to conclude a system-wide behavior. Complex system analysis often used to understand uh, in problematic uh, diverse fields. Last year in this building, we, as I told you, a medical doctor, we discussed the health care system. It is a, really a complex nature, complexity. And we learned a lot from this uh, complex system approach from how we oriented. I think that this, the discussion of this morning will be in touch with the complex system problematic. And I am sure that uh, uh, we, we will very close, we will in touch with general, more diverse questions. How can we differentiate 
the complex system analysis and reductionism. How can we differentiate a position paper with the objective research paper? I think these questions is extend the otherwise very important uh, uh, topic of ESAC report. But I think the scientists, we need always to look further and look over what we are dealing with. I wish you a very fruitful discussion this morning. And uh, it's a great pleasure again from the Hungarian Academy to host this meeting. Thank you very much. So, again, good morning. My name is Lars Walde. I'm the current chair of the ESAC Environment uh, Steering Panel. And e I will tell you a few words about ESAC first and then come back to how the process is when we select a topic for a report in ESAC system. ESAC was, is more than, a little more than 20 years old. It was created to give the different aspects, uh, different uh, parts of EU system advice on scientific topics which are relevant for political decisions. It's not a general scientific body giving advice on all kinds of topics. It's only topics relevant for decisions in the EU system. The member countries, the member academies are one academy in each EU member country. And in addition, Switzerland and Norway was invited very early to take part. And in addition, after Brexit, UK is still a member. So it has 28 academies across Europe as member academies. ESAC consists of three panels, one for environment, one for energy, and one for biosciences, which in practical terms are only medical and agricultural topics. But often the three panels are collaborating and acting together on issues, for instance, in agriculture, for instance, in energy and environment. So this is a general outline. Uh, the advice we're given uh, by the panels in reports and also in shorter state documents called statements or comments. But we are talking now, I'm going to talk about reports, the ESAC reports, and how the topics for the uh, reports are selected and finally agreed on. Uh, the, the initiative can come from any, uh, anybody really. It can sometimes come from the, uh, somebody close to the commission. For instance, the first nicotinoid report from 2015, the, and the initiative came from uh, uh, persons close to the commission at the time, Anne Glover, who was chief scientific advisor for Barroso, who was president of the EU commission for two, two periods. She took the initiative because there were questions about the effect of nicotinoids on honeybees at the time. We discussed the issue, we thought that in, in our panel, and we thought that this issue had, was much more important than only for honeybees. It was for pollinators in general, and after a while we also discovered that it was also other organisms, not only insects, not only pollinators, but also insects and <coughs> other invertebrates in the soil, for instance, and we extended the topic, and we gave the first neonicotinoid report in 2000. After that, as you will hear from Mike Norton, it has been a lo long discussion it, and, and we felt that time was now ripe for a new report on this issue and related uh, insecticides and, and other chemicals. So this is how, how is it dealt with in the EU system or in, and then later in the, how is it dealt with in ESAC system? Well, the panel first has to approve uh, the topic, that it's interesting, either because it is under 
political discussions in the EU system at the time when the proposal is made, but also perhaps because uh, scientists believe that this is going to be an important topic in the next few years. So then we, we decide in the panel that we would like to discuss this issue. But then the proposal goes to the uh, council. The council consists of ESAC, consists of one member from each member academy. So there are 28, 29 if we uh, also take into account Academy Europea and ALEA. And, and we discuss it and if it's approved there, then the, the uh, ESAC sends out an invitation to the member academies to nominate ex experts for the topic we have selected. So this goes to all member academies, close to 30 different organizations, and they can nominate experts in the field. Uh, sometimes we get many nominations, sometimes not so many. And ESAC, again, the panel can even ask academies to nominate one of experts we very much would like to have in the, in the expert group. So an uh, expert group is established and the expert group can be of varying size. In this case, we are discussing today, there are only 11 academies, uh, two, one of them, the Hungarian, nominated two. So we have, a, that's the number of experts in the expert group. In, in the previous, one year ago, I was in a similar occasion like this, in this academy. We presented a report also uh, by a large expert group, 28 people altogether. And, and so, so it can be a varying size, but expert groups usually has a size about maybe t 10 experts from different European countries. And this expert group then discuss the topic. And the report is written by input from the expert, but generally there is one person being the main editor and writer. And in this case, it's Mike Norton who will here, he will be presenting. And of course, he is in constant interaction with the expert group and all the individual experts and the group as a, as a group. And after a while, the, the final product is produced by and agreed by the expert group and then sent back to first to the panel. The panel discuss it. The panel in this case, the environment panel, discussed this report and of course made maybe some comments, but in general approve the document as it is. Then it's sent out for review. And the review is take place in the way that all member academies of ESAC is invited to nominate reviewers. And, and then the reviewers get the draft report and they comment on, the, on it, maybe make suggestions for changes, which can be incorporated by the author, and then later again back in the panel and finally to the council who endorse it, and then it will be sent to the member academy for endorsement. And then all, usually all uh, member academies, 28 now all together, endorse the report. And this is the result, is then the the final report, as you see in the printed version here, and it will be found on the, on the web. So this is a long process. It cannot be done in a sh short period of time. When the first neonicotinoid report was, became the, the um, uh, question from Anne Glover, who was chief scientific advisor to Barroso, she wanted the question within three or four weeks. We said that's impossible. We cannot do this process in in that short time. And then after a while we increase the topic from only honeybees to be all insects and later of course also to other invertebrates. So usually it will take at least one year, often up to two years to have a full report presented. And that is of course also a negative aspect because if, if a topic is hot politically of course, two years is a little too long time. We have the 
possibility to make shorter without this complicated process, as we do in some cases, and we are in currently doing that for one such topic, uh, which I will not mention, but, but it can be done in a shorter while, but not with all this complicated uh, endorsement by, by member academies. But in this case, it has been endorsed and, and is now by all member academies of ESARC, and it is now out as you can pick up your copy afterwards. So this is a full process. Uh, since this is a joint meeting of uh, ESAC and also uh, Academia Europea, I would like to mention that I also have a connection with Academia Europea since I was president there for six years, but it stepped down eight years back. So I have uh, uh, also a connection with Academia Europea in, in this connection. But here I'm as chair of the environment panel. And we have collaborated a little with the other two panels during the process, but this is mainly the process of the environment panel. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Vallo, for this presentation. Now I invite Professor Mike Morton, Michael Morton, Program Director of the IASAC, to give his presentation about the Neonix report. The floor is yours. Can we have uh, the slides on the screen? Well, let me say how pleased I am to be in uh, Budapest, uh, despite this uh, very sudden cold snap, which uh, took us back to January and February in, uh, <coughs> in terms of UK weather. Uh, let me thank very much the Hungarian Academy of Sciences for hosting this event and for offering a uh, good opportunity to have an open discussion on this, this uh, complex subject. <coughs> As uh, your Vice President mentioned, uh, so many issues in uh, modern society are complicated and there is a great deal of danger in trying to oversimplify them. But, uh, of course, the big uh, conundrum is that politicians like things to be simple. And so the communicating complex issues to political uh, decision makers is one of the big challenges that we try and face in ESAC. <coughs> As um, last uh, Professor Wallow mentioned, <coughs> ESAC has been going for 20 years and has a well-established st uh, structure for quality control and accessing the best science that is available in its member academies. The, <coughs> the 28 member academies that uh, uh, Professor Wallow mentioned <coughs> uh, meet twice a year at a council to over, over, overarch the uh, policy, but the individual decision makings uh, are made within the three uh, subject related panel uh, meetings, as, as uh, he mentioned, I am the director for the environment panel, and that means we try and cover issues ranging from climate change to uh, agricultural pesticides, as in this case, to deep sea mining, to any issue which is actually at the critical interface of environmental uh, uh, issues and political decision making. One of the big issues that uh, is persistent and applies to all member countries, of course, is how to effectively use forests. And of course, Hungary has a very rich uh, uh, resource in some of its forests, which have to be managed in a, a way that meets very multiple objectives, whether that's construction or supporting biodiversity or supporting carbon sinks. Anyway, that is not my subject today, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the general scope of the, of the work of ESAC. Um, as last mentioned, uh, 
the bit of the background to our earlier uh, report on uh, neonics, and we still have copies available of those outside if you, if you wish to pick one up. Uh, I would like to briefly uh, talk about the, the conclusions of that report as an illustration of how the ESAC process can actually interact with the policy. As last mentioned, the original objective of, or the original motivation for that study originated from the chief scientists at that time, who talked about the conflicting evidence that the Commission was receiving on the mortalities of bees and concern over colony collapse disorder and the role of neonicotinoids. And uh, as a result of that, we embarked in a survey which looked at the uh, issue from a more systems perspective. The uh, political argument was just basically neonicotinoids versus honeybees, but we saw it as a much broader system issue about the whole role of, uh, of that in the range of ecosystem services that are provided to agriculture. And that's pollination not just by honeybees, by other pollinators, not just bumblebees, solitary bees, but other insects that led us into the decline of insects in general and the role of them in the wider ecosystem. We looked at natural predator control as well as soil effects. And through this holistic approach, we were able to reach a number of quite key conclusions. We did emphasize the need to look at an ecosystem approach and the role of biodiversity in that, and that the empirical evidence and, and observational evidence shows this very large decline in insects. Um, and a critical point we made was that the argument over effects on neonicotinoids on honeybees was really a bit of a sideshow. And honeybees have this huge buffering capacity in their colony. And that meant, and they also have a lot of economic and social um, interactions ref reflecting in, the, in, the, in their, their use and their extent. And so trying to correlate cause and effect with honeybees was fraught with difficulty, fraught with high errors. And that led to very conflicting claims uh, from different stakeholders as to what was going on. When you looked at the broader ecosystem approach, the issue was a little clearer and we could reach certain conclusions that A, you should not just focus on honeybees, you should be thinking about bumblebees, solitary bees and other insects. There was uh, increasing evidence that widespread prophylactic use of neonicotinoids was having a substantial uh, negative effects and that uh, their special characteristics of neonicotinoids that's low cumulative toxicological impact was uh, not properly assessed by the regulatory system. So we made a number of recommendations and that actually led to the Commission changing the terms of reference in a scientific review to be conducted by EFSA to just dilute the focus on honeybees and extend to bumblebees and solitary bees and that had a substantial impact on the outcome of that re result that review which ultimately led to <coughs> the three main <coughs> neonicotinoids <coughs> being restricted to um, closed um, uh, applications so that was <coughs> that was the history and of course having covered that issue we kept it under under review we also carried out a subsequent uh, <coughs> project under the auspices of the Inter-Academy Partnership, which is the global umbrella for science academies. We carried out a regional study in Africa and published a report on the, the issues related to neonicotinoid use in Africa in 2019. And we also launched a similar study in Asia through the Association of Asian uh, Science Academies, which, uh, <coughs> which actually only reported last November. So having kept this under, control, uh, under review and having carried out regional uh, literature uh, updates, we thought uh, an update on the um, 
neonicotinoid issue would be very useful. And so <coughs> we, have, we discussed in council whether this was a priority and two years ago it was decided it was because the perpetual income of additional new science on the original neonicotinoids, we had already had an experience with new, uh, similarly uh, driven uh, chemicals entering the market and starting to repeat the, uh, the, the, the non-target impacts that have been encountered with the original neonicotinoids. There was a, an additional political issue in that a lot of countries were actually giving emergency authorizations to use uh, the, the prohibited neonicotinoids, so their use hadn't actually ceased. It had just uh, declined somewhat. And that was all set against the background of a sort of holistic approach by the Commission to try and <clears throat> create a framework where agriculture was more environmentally friendly, more supportive of biodiversity under the Green Deal, the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies. So this created a new way of looking at the issue which we thought uh, required some scientific assessment. After, after we decided to start this, uh, the issue became even more relevant because <clears throat> the Commission conducted a review of how effectively the sustainable use of pesticides directive had been implemented and, and concluded that it had not. And uh, as a result, they proposed last year to replace it with a, a tougher a reg regulation, which would be really founded on the application of integrated pest management. So that was another new issue which came up, which we included in, a, in our review. And of course, at the, uh, uh, from a year ago, with the invasion of Russia into Ukraine and the knock-on effects on energy supply and food supply, the whole issue of food security became much more uh, important on the political agenda. So these were the external factors that, within which we had to make some sort of scientific assessment of <coughs> sustainable agri agriculture and the role of neonicotinoids. Um, the report, which uh, you can, most of you probably have already picked up, uh, is outside. Um, it did take two years, as uh, uh, Professor Wallow mentioned, to conduct and co go through the review process. Just the review process takes about three to four months. First of all, there's a, there's a version of the report which is acceptable to the expert group. Then there's a submission to external peer reviewers who are nominated by each of the academies. And there's a final endorsement step where the final report is signed off by each of the member academies. Critical part of any major study is the expert group. <coughs> I'll just show you the expert group here. You'll be glad to see that there are two experts from Hungary and <coughs> also some names there which if you're active in the field you will recognize as being leading uh, uh, researchers who are widely published in, in journals ranging from nature to, <coughs> to science. These play a critical part in the, in the overall process. They provide the scientific input, the day-to-day -day scientific quality control, and provide a forum with which we can debate and explore the interaction between the science that we are confident we know and the policy implications where there's more room for, for debate. Um, the... The foundation of this study was, as I mentioned, some update in the science. And uh, we do spend quite some time in this report. There's a whole annex and about 300 or more papers uh, summarized in the annex and the summary of the, some of the key uh, more recent fi findings are found in the, in the main body of the report. Um, the, the summary of the, or like an overview of, uh, of the more recent science is meant to supplement 
the many reviews which have also taken place, uh, some major meta studies in 2015, 2017, and more recent ones in 2020. Because of our geographical focus of our regional studies, there's a particular emphasis on Asia and Africa. So there's a lot of Chinese studies in there and Japanese studies as well. And I just point out some of the key headline conclusions in, in that there's really quite a blossoming or booming of evidence on con the degree of contamination and the scope of contamination. Um, the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, one of the characteristics of neonicotinoids is, particularly when used in prophylactic mode, is that the majority of it does not enter the plant and the majority of it goes into either the soil or related aqueous systems. So the route for contamination is quite, quite smooth, quite well understood. And uh, just to give you some example of the scope of that, I have, well, there's one study which has found levels in the uh, Seto Island Sea, which is this uh, major sea in Japan, <coughs> between uh, Honshu and uh, Shikoku, and the levels of neonicotinoids there are found that are levels uh, which are ecologically significant. And very recently we found even, or there's a paper that reports even off the Australian coast and the Great Barrier Reef, there are levels of neonicotinoids which are said to be uh, at levels which may trigger biological consequences. In the report, there's many other uh, papers covering USA and <coughs> South America, uh, Africa. So the, the spread of the, this type of uh, chemical and relative persistence in aqueous systems is a critical side effect that has not been adequately uh, assessed by the regulatory system at the time of approval, yet is the source of many of the ecosystem effects. Aqueous systems losing their insect life affect fish and birds and have knock-on effects um, throughout the system. Also, a lot of Chinese work on contamination in vegetables and drinking water, again, uh, show the extent to which this has been a pathway to human intake, um, which mostly is below, below the uh, maximum uh, daily uh, limit under the regulatory system, but in one or two cases is, is getting close. Um, other st studies in there uh, bring together a lot of studies on the range of acute and sublethal toxic effects. Very interesting since 2015 when there was a, <clears throat> a big debate uh, between whether uh, honeybee colony collapse disorder was related to insecticides such as neonicotinoids or parasitic, uh, the Varroa uh, uh, ectoparasite. Uh, again, more recent figures have shown how those two stresses are interlinked and that <coughs> exposure to neonicotinoids reduces resistance to some of these parasites, whether it's uh, deformed wing virus or, or, or Varroa mites. So again, we have now, un now understand quite a lot more about the sublethal effects and mechanisms, immune system effects, and there's some more recent studies on higher trophic effects. Um, obviously, as insects decline, that has effects on higher levels such as birds because of lack of food supply or bats, but there are also more papers on direct toxic effects. <coughs> and there's some additional work on mammalian uh, and human impacts, but not sufficient to reach any major conclusions. However, the more recent studies do show the better understanding of the mechanisms through which <coughs> these neuroactive substances may affect human and mammalian uh, nerve receptors. These are less sensitive than in insect ones, of course, but they're still present in the human uh, neural system and uh, offer a potential uh, mechanism for adverse effects. So again, you need to have some sort of careful monitoring and further research to actually understand the scale that may be, un may be involved. Um, another group of subjects actually 
uh, evaluates to what extent prophylactic use actually creates a value to farmers in terms of reduced uh, crop loss and uh, whether, <coughs> whether those reduced crop loss justify the additional expense. And there are a number of studies which show that effects in some circumstances and some, uh, eva some areas evaluated, the effects are marginal to, to, to undetectable. So again, you've got a question of whether the uh, prophylactic use in particular is actually justified by the risk to that particular crop in that particular year and uh, the questions whether that <coughs> low risk in many cases justifies the environmental impact of, of, of widespread applications. So there's quite a range of additional res research results there which basically did not include any firm evidence that suggested that the original decision by the Commission was wrong or or too strict. Um, one of the key th political issues <coughs> which has uh, triggered some surveys by the uh, European Food and Safety Agency, EFSA, was the widespread use of some, by some member states of what they called emergency authorizations. These are allowed under the directive but according to certain conditions. They're meant to be a genuine emergency and it meant to be a case where the use of the pesticide is literally the last reserve resort and reflects the lack of any alternatives. These had in some cases been rather routinely repeated from year to year and <coughs> we, we summarised some of the uh, analyses of their justification but in fact uh, the European Court uh, came to a conclusion on that only six weeks ago that many of the authorizations did not comply with the uh, conditions that the Commission had proposed. And so if that court judgment is respected by member states, then the automatic repeat emergencies uh, will be, become more difficult and there will need to be more, much more detailed evaluation of risks and benefits before these are approved in the future. The two main uses of these are actually two very problematic uh, pests. One is the oilseed rape flea beetle and one is the uh, sugar beet yellow leaf virus which is also transmitted by aphids. And, uh, and many of the emergency authorizations have been given to prevent uh, crop loss from these. We've summarized in two boxes some of the evidence on how uh, justified these are. I mean, they're definitely a problem and there's definitely not a simple solution, but there are a range of <coughs> approaches which have been quite successful in some countries, such as Sweden, where they can avoid the need for prophylactic use. So that was authorized emergency authorizations. <coughs> the next subject we looked at was the the natural tendency of the industry to offer new alternatives if one particular uh, active substance is prohibited or limited, then there's a natural innovation pressure to try and replace that with something equally or better effective. Um, there is a whole range, a huge range of uh, chemical combinations which can all be based on the same uh, neuroactive um, mechanism of the original neonicotinoids. Um, some of those have made it into the EU regulator, uh, into the EU agricultural use. Many, many more are actually at different stages in other parts of the world or different stages in the R&D lab. And we uh, devote a whole annex to s summarizing some of these <coughs> and the underlying chemistry as you see in the bottom there. In terms of the EU, the, um, the first uh, chemical to be approved was sulfoxiflor. Um, and of course that, since it has a similar mechanism, has a similar possibility of uh, side effects on, on non-target organisms. And in fact, over the, the first few years of use, 
similar reports of side effects started to emerge. And I think last year the, <coughs> the EFSA decided that it was not um, safe to be, for bees and lacked evidence on other broader non-target organism effects. And so sulfoxiflor also has been prohibited for outside use and restricted to greenhouse or en enclosed use. <coughs> the second uh, uh, substitute was uh, flupiridiferone. Uh, that has some debate over its side effects and is still in use, uh, but there are further studies to be carried out to decide on its long-term uh, acceptability. And this raises the general issue of uh, how do we actually ensure that the replacements for the, the molecules which have been judged to be too toxic for approval, how do we avoid those becoming what we call regrettable substitutions? In other words, you, get, you, you prohibit one active substance, you replace it with another, and all you do is you go through the same deja vu cycle of use and finding there are unpredicted negative side effects which <coughs> overall are unacceptable, leading to uh, uh, an, uh, an additional prohibition. So we do spend some time discussing how to get around this. And the, uh, the key, of course, is the testing regime. I mean, the, the reason the uh, neonics were originally approved despite the later evidence of their negative effects, was because the testing regime did not evaluate the properties that turned out to be very important when they were used in the field. They didn't properly evaluate the, the cumulative toxicity of low doses over a long period of time. They didn't evaluate the full range of non-target species. They didn't really look at the potential for uh, persistence and spread through aqueous systems. So there is a huge debate going on on how can we improve this system because what we're looking for is a mechanism which properly evaluates the use of that pesticide in the field, in the, in the actual real farm and in the real environment. But of course for a testing you have to simplify, you have to make something workable uh, quantifiable and there's a huge debate going on there within EFSA on how to modify the current regulatory system to better predict the effects in, in, in the environment. Now that, um, <coughs> that is too complicated to go in through now but the overall weaknesses we summarize here, the, the fact that exposure by that the non-target organisms like bees can be very multiple, can be much more uh, varied and in, in time and space than pr predicted in the, in the tests. And how to get that is leading to a, what we call a systems environmental risk assessment, which is something we think is the right direction and is something that the EFSA is actually pursuing and is likely to in uh, integrate over the next few years. But the main new uh, focus of the new regulation is, is integrated pest management. Uh, the s original Sustainable U Use of Pesticides Directive said all member states should have a, a priority for this, but uh, it's turned out not to be uh, really significantly uh, applied in member members, many member states. And so the uh, new regulation makes this much more at the central core of the regulation, placing a, a, a big responsibility on member states to try and integrate this into agriculture. Um, these are the schematic diagrams of integrated pest management. The bottom line is that you try and avoid your pest problem, first of all, through a, a range of uh, cultural or, or genetic or, or landscape effects. Then you have to do some sampling and detection to monitor any pest damage and only when those uh, threats exceed certain thresholds would you get to the, state, the final stage of actually using some targeted uh, chemical control to try and deal with that specific 
test in that specific circumstances at that specific location. There's a similar thing for pollination, which I won't go into. But <coughs> the whole point of IPM is to limit chemicals to where they're really needed. And uh, so they, it has been, it's not new, it's been, it's been on the agricultural research agenda and application of international programs for, for decades. There's a lot of evidence in the past how effective it can be, but it does require more thinking, more complicated, more decisions, more monitoring, and as pressures on farmers get to run down their, their or, or, or reduce their, their numbers working there, to industrialize, to simplify their supply chain and their, their, their cultivation methods, there's a natural tendency that this is, go, this is too complicated, maybe too uncertain sometimes, and that has led to the dependency on prophylactic or calendar-based sprays that we see in so many farms now. So the big challenge here, which is what we're trying to help the com Commission uh, get to grips with, was to how to make IPM easier and how to make it beneficial so farmers prefer it to, to the current uh, system. Um, we spend a lot of time on this, which I don't have time to go in for now. Uh, we have to look at education awareness particularly. We need to facilitate the ability to farmers to actually develop and apply the tools that you need. Uh, some of those basic services should be uh, provided collectively. Uh, there's a big role for the CAP in trying to uh, relate payments to incentives. There's even some potential for carbon offsetting because if you reduce pesticides, you, you do have a big impact on the carbon footprint of your agriculture. And there's a huge role for the agrochemical industry in trying to facilitate this process to provide tools and make life easier for implementing IPM. And we need to apply it at a landscape level. So there's a huge range of potential uh, benefits here, which, but none of them are going to be easily achievable. They all need some fairly systems thinking to try and make it easier for farmers so they can make a decision that's in their own interests, which is also in the interests of the Commission's broader policies on, on uh, green uh, farm to fork and biodiversity. Um, um, slightly, uh, just to start winding up, a uh, slightly more technical issue is that uh, uh, overall the objective is to reduce the toxic load to agriculture of uh, maintaining our food supply. Uh, the Commission has two indicators, which, each of which has a reduction target. But we point out that actually when you look at some measures of toxic load on, the, uh, on farmland, the increase over the last uh, three decades since the introduction of neonicotinoids has been quite substantial. And one study suggests that the toxic load on US agriculture has gone up by a factor of four to 48 fold over the last 30 years. So if we're trying to get back to a less toxic ag agriculture, we really need slight, slightly more uh, ambitious uh, targets and we suggest, make some suggestions on how that might be achieved. So just to summarize um, what, what uh, the report uh, concluded, it's pretty broad. Um, we, we, first of all, as I've mentioned, we don't find any evidence that the original restrictions were unjustified. If anything, they have been uh, end, additionally endorsed. Um, on the contamination side, there's some very interesting work, which is since we uh, published, which does suggest there is some indication that the restrictions on uh, imidacloprid and the others in Europe may have some impact on reducing contamination levels in some indicator products like honey. Um, and we can compare that with the widespread evidence of increased contamination in other parts of the world. So there's some superficial evidence that the, the EU restriction may be having some sort of beneficial effect on the broader environmental side. Uh, we, uh, we look at the post-approval, uh, we look at the uh, testing regime. Uh, we also 
emphasise the importance of better monitoring of how pesticides are actually used so we can feed back into an early detection of adverse effects. We support the systems approach to testing. And we, we also uh, encourage this, the Commission to take account of all our analyses of the challenges of IPM in trying to, um, trying to uh, encourage farmers to use IPM as their main tool, pointing out the substantial barriers and also finally encourage a more ambitious target for reducing the toxic load. Um, we, we have a final review comment, as I mentioned, and uh, one or two of our uh, academies were, while they supported the focus of our report on the, the framework that we started, which is the Green Deal and uh, the Farm to Fork and the Biodiversity Strategy, did attach more importance to the threat to food security as a result of the Russian invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine and, of course, as a result of continual population growth and continued uh, demand for food uh, globally. So there was a comment that we needed to place our analysis in this broader perspective, which we fully accept. Um, <clears throat> there were one or two comments who didn't really see neonics as such a threat to uh, the environment or, or they saw their beneficial role in food production as outweighing that. And uh, we also had one comment who thought we had ignored organic agriculture too much and we should have spent more time on organic. So we had some comments driving us one way and some comments driving us the other way. So that's often the case in the final, final review. So I hope I've given you a, a, an overview of the scope of this report. Um, there's obviously a lot, lot more detail in it, and I encourage you to uh, make full use of that. And uh, I look forward very much to a, a productive discussion with our fellow um, speakers uh, in the panel discussion afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Morton, for the presentation of the report. Now there will be uh, three invited <laughs> comments. And I ask first Professor Erwin Balaj, member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, president of the section of Agricultural Sciences, to keep his comment in 10 minutes. Dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to comment this document published by ISAC. And uh, myself, I will make some general comments because Professor Hornock, who is an expert scientist in plant protection, he had a chance on behalf of the agriculture section to comment this document previously in written form. And I know that he had communication with Professor Mike Norton. And I don't want to uh, repeat what he will tell later on his uh, talk and comment on this program. What is my major concern as uh, uh, seeing the document? It's very simple. When I was graduating student, graduate student, I met with a very nice book in my bookshelf that was The Silent Spring. And it was an alerting document that if you use only chemicals in the agriculture to protect your crop, it could be causing several environmental problems in the nature. And this was the period, actually, when in our country, a well-known botanist, Professor Gabor Ubrigi, who was specialized in weed sciences and had been the director of the Plant Protection Institute, academician, member of the Academy of Sciences, and he was keen on ecological point of the uh, plant protection, even introduced experimental uh, uh, systems in apple orchard 
and also in cornfield to study the IPM. So IPM is not a new thing. It's already introduced in the Hungarian agriculture and moreover all over the world that integrated pest management is the best way how you can see the ecological points and keep the agriculture going. I feel myself a little bit puzzled when I have seen the title of this document which deals and put the neonicotines in it, a compound which already had been a ban in European Union back six years. So why we are going back on that chemicals which we can use only in exceptional emergency cases? So this is just the justification that they, the decision of the European Commission was, was correct. I have no trust on European Commission at all because those illiteral uh, politicians doesn't understand anything. So whatever you put on their table, they will uh, amazed by this. And what is my major point of this? This is deals with IPM, which we already know that it's the way how you should uh, use agriculture in practice. Farmers are not stupid at all. They don't want to use excess amount of pesticides because it's costly. In our country, they developed, in, even in this Plant Protection Institute, colleagues on pheromone traps, which is really the way how you can use an environmental friendly uh, plant protection. Because pheromone traps will concentrate the, the use of the insecticide in a given time and not to use regularly. So this is environmentally friendly technology even used in the organic farming. Both I feel that IPM, which is deal this very nicely and precisely in this, this document, it's, I feel it's just reinventing the wheel because we know that it's an already existing and well elaborated technology and used all over the world and consider that this is the way how we should uh, consider the environmentally friendly agriculture, either conventional one or uh, organic. Agriculture is always guilty. Why we are guilty? We are guilty because the development of agriculture sciences made it possible that we can feed 8 billion people. If we, if we if we uh, make such kind of restriction in Europe, what is going on at the moment based on the chemophobia, I'm not talking of the GM phobia, build up in the societies, who will feed uh, the half billion European citizen if we destroy the European agriculture? Is it feasible and economically friendly to import overseas from food and feed uh, from uh, South uh, America or North, North Africa? Maybe it will be very, very economically friendly to use cargo plane burning a lot of kerosene or ship run by, by diesel fuel. Is it economically and environmentally feasible to follow it? We have to have self-subsidy and self-sustained agriculture in Europe. If we are restricting with so strict regulation as, as we have, and if, if I correctly cite the document, there is a, a note that more than 10,000 paper has been published on neonicotinoids. And out of them, only 80 works and deal with environmental effects. It means that the neonicotinoids were absolutely perfectly studied mode of action of that group of pesticide. And I'm sure that a lot of paper concern also environmental issue on toxicity on different uh, other non-target organisms. But I feel that, of course, we need more environmental study on different pesticides but we cannot live without chemical control in a modern agriculture. 
So this is my major con uh, concern of this paper because uh, if you use uh, in the title, of course, to sell a document, it's easy to find a fancy title to attract the, the readers. <coughs> Nowadays they are calling it a sex, sexy title you need. Yes, it is. But the problem is that the people, the average people in different countries can be easily manipulated, including politicians. And this is why I'm afraid that this is a, a document which is supporting the chemophobia build up in the societies. We cannot live without chemical control. Just one single uh, uh, example. In black Africa, 30% of, of uh, the popu black population suffering for, from esophagus uh, cancer. And this is due because there is no chemical control in the cornfield and the fusarium toxin, which is contaminated those uh, crop, is very uh, dangerous because an agent for causing cancer. And without chemical control, we make it possible that the people is, uh, will get sick or die due to this fact. Back to those era when Hungary was in the, the first country all over the world in, in 68 who banned the DDT and chlorinated hyd hydrocarbons to use. Still there are some country in the world they are using time to time these chlorinated hydrocarbons against the mosquitoes because the mosquitoes are the, the parasite uh, dealing with the malaria and transferring the malaria. And when a, a South Asian country leaders are seeing that the poor kids are suffering from malaria and die, they decide, well, maybe it is dangerous and I have to use an emergency case because I have to save my children from malaria. So I, I'm, I'm not for, uh, let's say, for fan of the big companies, so I'm not paid by the companies. But we have to understand that chemical, without chemical control, even organic farming couldn't exist. Organic farming also using chemicals like nicotine. Nicotine is a bloody poisonous agent. Of course, that's natural because coming from the, from the tobacco. So I think this is my general comment on this document. Actually, it's a very nice document. I don't want to tell that it's not, I, I didn't find the, too much problem with it because it's a good summary. But I don't see the rationality why we had to publish again a second document on neonicotinoids, which is not really dealing with neonicotinoids. It's just using as a, as a let's say, side effect. It's just the IPM. Why it's not? The title is that the, 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 the IPM, how you use the modern technology in the IPM. IPM is also will change, developing the, the technology in, in agriculture. They are using new technologies. This year, we are celebrating the 70 years anniversary of the first corn hybrid produced in the European Union. And this changed completely the uh, corn production in, in the world. Beforehand or even today, if you have a corn land race, the productivity is 1.5 tons per hectare if it's in good, with good, good condition. With a, a reasonable corn hybrid producing 20 tons easily. I'm not talking about the US technology when they can reach 30. But even in Europe, it means that it's more than 10 times we have more product and this makes it possible to feed the people and, and having enough food. So this is which, uh, which I have to protect agriculture sciences because it's always I feel that agriculture is the guilty because we are 
let's say, poisoning the, the people, which is not true. The system, which the, the regulators and the controlling system all over the world, except in some countries, they're pretty, pretty much good. I trust EPA in the US, and not only I trust the EPA, the, the US citizens are having respect on the EPA because they know, know that they, they, their role and they, their task is to protect the citizens from any kind of environmental uh, harm or, or, or problem. So, sorry if I'm, I'm too strict or strong on, on this, but I had to defend a little bit agriculture, at least as I'm head, I'm, I'm the head of the section, so otherwise they will kick me from the department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Walash. Now I ask Professor Hornok, Laszlo Hornok, member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Professor Emeritus at the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences, to keep the second invited comments in 10 minutes, please. Vice President, uh, dear guest professors, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. Erwin, thank you. I am not a big expert. Sorry. I left Plant Protection Institute 33 years ago, and I became a pensioner six years ago, so I am not a big expert. But uh, I wrote some four papers about the subject. Don't be afraid. I will not read all of them. Some selected sentences, however, However, I should like to emphasize. First, during my 50 year scientific life, I was never interested either in using or pursuing pesticides. This is important. I had an other subject. However, I have, I, I am, I strongly believe that the European agriculture is not among the significant causes of global environmental and climatic problems. I am strongly believed. In spite of this, we are continuously fighting against European agriculture. This is a mistake, I think. Uh, in spite of this, I expected, well, I, I, I accepted the invitation to review the ERSAC report just to see that what, what is the real meaning of this continuous fighting against the interest of European agriculture. But I found the report really an excellent one. It's a beautiful work, professional, easy to write, easy to read, easy to understand. Almost everything is perfect, but there is one exception. It is exclusively an ecological report. So nothing about practical agriculture, nothing about the economy of the restrictions, so a bit unilateral, I feel. So uh, I have some critical remarks. I will not read all of them, but, but some really, I think, can be interesting first. The biological control, the value of biological control is over, over emphasized in the report. Uh, there is only one successful biocontrol agent, and this is Bacillus thuringiensis, and we discovered it 70 years ago. The others are always, sometimes we tried it, and after it turned out that they are useless. So the whole market, or the whole pesticide market, is covered by biocontrol agents only at a 3%, 3% by biocontrol agents. The other is chemicals. The same is with botanical pesticides. What are the botanical pesticides? 
on page 20 I read, or on, yes, on page 20 I read that Azadi Rachtin is a good substitute for neonicotinoids. Azadi Rachtin cannot be used under field conditions. But these are, these are really problems. But, but not, not much details I want to speak about this. The major weakness of the report is the lack of economical calculations. The authors suggest the entire withdrawal of neonicotinoids and other chemicals with similar mode of action, and they support further the wide dissemination of IPM technologies. These proposals, together with the anti-pesticide and anti-chemical attitude of the European Commission pushes, push towards the entire European agriculture towards so-called organic farming. Organic farming means at least 50% less yield. Who can pay for that? There are literature data for that. During the discussion, I can show the literature data. Such a strong anti-pesticide attitude completely ruins the competitiveness of the European farmers. Think it over, please. In the United States, there are 72 active ingredients, not products, 72 pesticides that are already banned in the European Union. And they use in the United States. And such pesticides are used in Brazil, used in China. How the European farmers can compete with these countries? And how the Hungarian farmers can compete with Ukrainian and Serbian farmers next to our door? They are here. And they can freely use neonicotinoids and everything. So this is a real problem. And, I said, as far as the Hungarian situation is concerned, the number of honeybee colonies increased from 508, no, five, 500,000, 500,000 to 850,000, more than 60% increase between 2,000 and 2018, then neonicotinoids were used. These data are exact. Came from the Hungarian Central Statistical Office and was advertised by Mr. Peter Brosch. He is the president of the Hungarian Beekeeper Society. This is a, this is a nice society, 150 years old. And this president stated that the Hungarian bee colonies drastically increased in spite of using neonicotinoids. My conclusion is that these data indicate that neonicotinoids caused no harm in Hungarian honeybee population. Uh, there are problems with wild bees as well, even if we don't know how, how many wild bee species exist in the Carpathian Basin. But there is an even more important aspect. Banning neonicotinoid, neonics, that's more easy to say, is especially disadvantageous to sunflower growers, oil seed rape growers and seed corn producers. These are the three cultures. Before banning neonicotinoids as seed dressing chemicals, 80% of seed corn production, production came from three countries, France, Hungary and Romania. I found no representatives of France, Germany, Great Britain, Romania, and Spain among the authors of this panel. These are the most important oil seed producing countries in Europe. Hungary is also an important oil seed producer, but we have representatives, of course, but not from the division 
of agriculture of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. This division has 1,700 members. Nobody were invited into the panel to tell his or her opinion about the situation. Uh, on the contrary, there are representatives from countries where sunflower or seed core production is just never seen. We will not delegate members when the ASAC, for example, wants to uh, examine the fishing problems in the North Sea because we are not expert in that. So uh, the situation is more or less interesting. otherwise. The report is a beautiful report from an ecological point of view, but from agriculture, I cannot agree in, in its conclusions. And it is really dangerous for the European agriculture if we continue fighting against chemicals, against pesticides, against, because there is a huge race on the international market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hornok. Now I ask Professor András Sekács, Doctor of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, member of the expert group, to keep the third invited comment in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. I won't give you a presentation again. No, thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, and also audience over the internet, I'm very happy to be here. I thank for the present for the invitation to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Also, I thank the Academy for delegating me to this. Uh, working group, so it's been a pleasure to do that. And I was, I've been baffled a little bit, perplexed, what to say, for two, two reasons. One, I was expecting a very good presentation from Mike, so there is not much room for me uh, left. Uh, but the other, which is more important, is that uh, I contributed to this work. So what am I addressing now? Partially my own work? Well, that may be the case, so I, th I thought, for the time, considering the time uh, restraints and also this aspect, that I would emphasize only two issues which have been mentioned uh, from uh, the, the report, uh, which has relevance to our actual research, and um, I will go into those two points. One of these is the mode of action, neonicotinoids. So, um, Neonicotinoids means, means nicotine-like novel substances. They all act on the uh, nicotinic, acetyl, uh, nicotinic um, acetylcholine receptor in insects, and it's a great luck for us, so to speak, that we have immense differences physiologically in our own uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in mammalians from those in insects, and that is why these substances, these neonicotinoids, can be so powerful, so extremely useful uh, on insects, and still have little or no toxicity, at least no neurotoxicity, negligible neurotoxicity on higher order animals. So that is the key for the success of neonicotinoids in use. And, but also that is the source for, for the controversy and disadvantages and the ecological effects which indeed have been considered in this uh, uh, survey. Um, the issue here is that 
the term neonicotinoid doesn't refer to any chemical class. Neonicotinoids are substances that act on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, regardless whether those are nitrobonidines or cyanoimids or cyanosulfoximids. Uh, so, sulfonimids, sorry. So, these are all neonicotinoids, and that's an important issue in the report because we are, in, in the presentations, we refer to neonics as, is, as if these five substances, five active ingredients were neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are coming, are, are new substances are there in other chemical classes, and even newer are in development, and the same problems can be expected uh, from these compounds, some of these compounds, particularly because they act by the same mode of action as these traditional neonics, the first five. So we can't hope, uh, hope for an escape from this trap situation, ecological trap situation. It has to be emphasized. Combined this feature of uh, high insect specificity of neonicotinoids with, uh, with their other feature of systemic character, characteristic, make them possible to be applied in uh, seed coating, seed dressing, which is uh, assumed to be environmentally benign uh, uh, or has been claimed as an environmentally benign mode of ap uh, application. I will get to that. But anyway, one uh, consequence of that is that because uh, they are, these substances are absorbed and uh, taken up by or uptaken by the plants, the compounds offer new routes of exposure to non-target organisms as well. And one um, example for that, for example, is the gutation liquid of the, of the plants uh, through which non-target insects can be exposed and that can strongly affect the risk uh, and the risk assessment process also. We ourselves have extensive work on that field. And the other point is, rela is related to the excessive use. Uh, one can say neonics are another example of uh, too much of a good thing. Um, what is termed prophylactic use, this seed coating use, um, is on the one hand doesn't mean um, a lower dosage actually than uh, say spray applications or granule applications. It's in the very same range of uh, dosage and environmental load. And also considering the fact that a very low per percentage of the active ingredient applied is actually absorbed in the plant. 96% of the applied substance is uh, dissipated in the soil and have its effects there. It's not, um, it's overly active, I would say. It's not perfected ecologically. And, uh, but the most important conclusion is that even though IPM is the optimal, considered the optimal uh, industrial uh, agrotechnology method, um, these substances cannot be in seed coating application be, uh, be uh, compliant with integrated pest management, simply for the fact because when we use a, a seed, treated, uh, a seed treatment, we have no choice to time our application to the emergence of the pest to the threshold uh, population, which we decided that we have, we take protection measures only after that level. So, uh, and also we cannot time our application. At the time of seed, seeding the seeds, we have made a decision that we will apply these substances on those crops over the vegetation period needed or not. So because of that and because of the, of the convenience of the application technology, um, neonicotinoids grew extensively over the pesticide market. The pesticide market itself grew immensely, and within that also to substantially the insecticide market, and neonicotinoids reached one-third of the entire insecticide market by 2020. 
So this huge amount of applied substance, 500,000 tons a year, cannot remain without consequences, I would say, and that is an important message, I guess, in the, uh, in the, the report. So these two messages are important for us, uh, have been important in our work, and have been important in the report. I am very proud that 10, actually, 10 of our previous studies have been reported and uh, have been re reviewed in the report, uh, which show not, not only referring to them, but also with short description. There are three others which I also listed. And looking, I will not go into details on this uh, slide, uh, but looking at the uh, surrounding, uh, policy surrounding, and also voices from the scientific world, I find it no surprising that this report came up with a con conclusion it, uh, it did. In fact, it would have been surprising if it had denied decades of results accumulating in the scientific world. So I, um, I would say it is important to promote, or maybe more important than dealing with the neonicotinoids, to promote integrated pest management, but then it has to be integrated pest management according to the principles of integrated pest management. And last, not least, it's an issue, a big issue, and we have heard that there, there have been no other um, uh, aspects, societal aspects, considered in this report. It's a big question. Are we dealing with science, a science issue or a policy issue? Because, in fact, in science-based risk assessment, that should be a value-free ideal. It should be, it should, our, our risk assessment of the risk is not dependent on the fact how much we need that, that technology or how little we need that. In this case, it's, it's a very much used and very much needed. We depend on that, but we made our technology, we formed our technology that way that it's dependent on neonics. We still have a possibility in risk management to make choices, which is then a policy-based, fit-for-purpose, value management decision. We do that. We have technologies which we know are risky, but we accept them. We don't abandon them because of their convenience, because of their uh, efficacy. So it's a possibility to remain with those, but risk assessment has to be exact and valid because we have to know, even if society decides to use technologies or keep technologies in use, to know exactly the risks that are being posed by that technology to know what price we will have to pay if we decide to stay on the, the current application type of, tech, in this case, this technology. Thank you very much. to come to these armchairs to place seats. The next discussion lasts 20 minutes, during which time you in the audience also ask questions and make comments, and I will also interpret questions from the YouTube channel. Due to this quite short time available, please keep those questions and answers as concise as possible. I will try to keep the to the time frame, and again, I would uh, repeat that if you ask questions, please tell your names and affiliations. Thank you very much. I will open the discussion. So, I know always the first is the hardest to start. The ladies in the room will also listen. Okay, there is somebody. Well, it's always complicated to be the first. <laughs> so my name is Marton Jolankoi. I'm a professor in crop production, by the way. So just three very, very short comments. By the way, it was really an interesting thing. And, and of course, I, I see that there are some minor tensions 
but in accordance with that, uh, I would say the first would be that about chemistry, all of us, we are biochemical structures and the whole nature is working on that basis. Remember, Paracelsus Bombastus, some 500 years ago, stated that every sort of compound is poisonous regarding its concentration. So I think, we, if I would like to refer to that, the application system, that's what is really important. Second, uh, this uh, scientific world, tangent or whatever, I would say a uh, Hungarian proverb, it says that the road to the hell is paved by goodwill. Remember that, that that can be used. Road to the hell is paved by goodwill. Uh, number three, I, I, I was listening to, to Professor Bollard because he mentioned the malaria and it was really a fantastic story prior to the chemical applications because the first medical Nobel Prize it was, it was given, was awarded to Ronald Ross. Uh, he was a, probably, probably all of you or most of you know, he was a, a British soldier, a, med a medical doctor, by the way, in the Indian Army. And he was the man who, who was working with malaria and with the, with the role of, of the anophilus and the cutex, uh, the, the mosquitoes and so on. By the way, he made suggestions how to, how to stop malaria and how to stop the propagation of mosquitoes. And at his time, of course, he, 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 he were, he were, his suggestions were not taken into, into consideration, just not because for chemical purposes, by, by religious purposes that time, because that time the, the, his bosses said that even the mosquito is a gift of God, a creature in the world. And we have to, we have to think about. It's also just, just to ponder about the role of environmental protection as well. I don't know how far shall we go or not. Thank you, Orman. Thank you. Uh, who, who would like to wish to answer this comment? But thank you, Professor Wall. Yes. I would like to answer some more general questions related to what we just heard. It was said in the introduction here now that uh, the, it was not as necessary with a new uh, report on neonicotinoids. Sorry, shall I use the microphone? Yes. 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 It was said in one of the introducers that it was not necessary now with a new report on neonicotinoids because the most important aspects was presented in the first. And in a, in a sense, I agree. But it's necessary because of all the loopholes that has been explored by, by uh, later use of the neonicotinoids. And in this sense, uh, I think that it was necessary with a new report. But I agree that uh, we, we have most of the arguments in the first report. Now, it's the testing regime and how we should deal with new substances. And to be explicit on this point, the environment panel is not negative to all kinds of use of chemicals. We are not arguing that only organic farming, for instance, is, is the way forward. We, we definitely need chemicals, just as we need it for the f fight of malaria and, and other, as we just heard. So it's only in this sense we have to evaluate the benefits against the dangers. And in this case, I think we have now shown that some of the rules we have for testing new substances, for instance, have been insufficient. And that is the main reason for a new report and, and new uh, discussions on the use of neonicotinoids. They can still be used in closed uh, environments and, and they may be even the last uh, tool in, in some instances if all the other uh, aspects have failed. And, and it's not true that 
our environment panel in members are in general against all use of, for instance, chemicals in, in agriculture. Thank you. Mr. Morna, please. Thank you. I am Peter Molnar, the founder of the On the Advanced Slam Academy, which also deals with issues of climate change. And my question is that uh, it, we just heard in one of the comments that, that uh, European agriculture does not significantly contribute to climate change. I would like to hear uh, some more about it, also because part of the danger seems to be that everyone can say that what I contribute to climate change is not necessarily the most significant or significant enough to, to fight that contribution. So uh, I see the argument made for use of chemicals in agriculture, but also uh, I would like to raise the question whether, uh, whether perhaps those of you who argued in defense of agriculture, again, which I see the argument for, perhaps under, underestimate the contribution to climate change that uh, you, our agriculture in Europe can do if we don't, uh, don't uh, make fundamental changes. Thank you. Who would like to wish to answer? But then also Professor Norton. But first you, okay. Please, you, you. I don't want to yes, yes. Okay. Uh, what I thought exactly is not among the, among the sig most significant, uh, exactly, most significant, most significant causes. Not among the most significant causes. Yes, it, it's true. Overpopulation, traffic, cars. We have five million cars in this country in this small country, and we are fighting against always <laughs> agriculture. Agriculture is a ma ma European agriculture, not the tropical agriculture. The European agriculture is a minor problem. I maintain this, this sentence. Professor Martin. Um, well, thank you for the question. Um, there are a number of interactions between the subject of our report on climate change, which I'll mention. Um, the, the first one is that at least some studies have tried to quantify the uh, carbon footprint of pesticide manufacture, distribution, and use, and came to the conclusion that the emissions from pesticide use in general, this is not just neonicotinoids, this is in general, were equivalent to the emissions from aviation. So that gives you a... <clears throat> an indication of the carbon footprint of the actual pesticide manufacturing use. Um, another aspect we had to consider was um, with uh, the warming proceeding at a perhaps even faster pace than projected in some of the mo earlier models, um, what is that effect going to have on pest uh, crop sus susceptibility and vulnerability to pests? And uh, there we found some studies which suggest that um, with a 2% rise, and we're already on 1.3, 1.4, um, then many of the major crops will be increasingly susceptible to pests, and that in turn will um, give additional uh, pressure on farmers to respond to that, and of course that gives you an urgency to ensure that they don't respond to that just by doubling or tripling the amounts of pesticides already in use, so that again uh, gives a sense of urgency to trying to uh, expand and uh, improve the application of IPM in farming. Um, and of course then there's the overall um, uh, assessment of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from different sectors of the economy and agriculture normally comes out depending on the country, depending on the region, uh, like 20-25% of the greenhouse gas emissions, um, which, which are contributed from 
CO2 from nitrous oxide, from fertilizers, and very importantly in some parts of the world, from the land use change, which is uh, the removal of the native cover and replacement by uh, farmland, which re removes the carbon stock in the original cover. So it's a, it's a, it's a very broad range of interactions, um, some of which are relevant to pesticides, some of which are more relevant to the overall objective of reducing overall emissions. Other questions? Please, the lady there. Yes, my name is Louise Vett. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm an uh, evolutionary ecologist um, of age, and I have worked since, I think, the end of 1970s uh, on matters of biological control and prevention of the use of chemical pesticides. Uh, actually, the research was on the, in the base, on the basis of uh, the complete change in agricultural systems in greenhouses where first uh, the chemicals were being used and the resistance was enormous and we completely changed over to biological control, which is uh, such an excellent example of how we can actually prevent the, 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 the development of pests and diseases. So, don't get me wrong, biological control and integrated pest management especially, and I'm not against the last use of chemicals indeed, um, is over 110 years old. And it has been fascinatingly well, you know, used, uh, produced. Um, we have Coppert Company in the Netherlands, which is a multinational, which delivers a lot of biologicals, and I'm not paid by them. I've heard a lot of nonsense this morning, I'm sorry, of two people that apparently have had, if I can be directly uh, like, like the Dutch are, head under a stone because there is a revolution going on in how we approach the prevention of pests and diseases. We all know that it, that it is actually uh, also uh, plant resistance, of course, and plant breeding that are so crucial. And what we now know as uh, a person who works on multitrophic interactions above and below ground interactions, that we now know because of the recent research of the last 10, 20 years, that the soil and all its strength of the microbiome is influencing how our crops are responding uh, you know, to pests and how we can help with the soil to prevent pests and diseases. So IPM definitely is the future and it will absolutely be based on this above below ground interaction. Yeah, and, and I've been director of the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, the half of the institute works on the soil. We have some great people here in the Hungarian uh, Academy as well working on that kind of aspect. And I'm flabbergasted that that has not been seen by two of the speakers this morning. So I really would like to ask you, you know, other, <laughs> other things that I'm all totally confused. Honeybees are social animals. They can actually relate to these nicotinoids much different. We have 350 species of solitary bees in the Netherlands and the 56% are on the red list, right? We know that in the soil, the, both the microbiome and in the water as well, and microorganisms not only, but also microfauna, is just completely disturbed by the use of these pesticides. We also know that because of the ecological theory and practice that we now have and the knowledge of below ground, that the yield crop is 10 to max 20% if we look at organic and we look at conventional. We also know that in periods of droughts, and we have scientific evidence that the soil structure and also, in fact, the crops suffer greatly from drought if they've been produced in, in a non-organic way with a lot of pesticides and the crops are lower. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a changing environment and a changing way of producing food. 70 7% of our land use is for feeding our cattle, not humans. We can easily feed 10 billion people on this world. Then we have to produce it where it's being consumed for a major deal. Not always, not always possible, but that is the case. So I would like to ask the two gentlemen to really look into the recent science 
And we have lots of younger people that have a great idea how we're going to feed 10 billion people on this planet. And I'm embarrassed to hear this. Thank you very much. So I think Professor Warnock. Thank you, these remarks. So basically I am, basically I am not against biocontrol agents. My group was the first who made a transgenic trichoderma 30 years ago. It was completely useless otherwise. My group was the first who started to, to study the coniotherium minitans, what are the, the weapons of this fungus, what we wanted to use against sclerotinia sclerotiolum. And we found that a glucanase enzyme gene is important for this fungus to, to, to be efficient against the sclerotinia rods in some flora. And I accept that biocontrol agents are excellent under glass houses, in glass houses. But in the opener, we tried, for example, this coniotherium against sclerotinia rod in some flora. Even products are available. Nobody wants to buy. Nobody. They don't use it. And repeat again, the practice, only 3% of the total pesticide market is covered by biocontrol agents. 97 is covered by chemical agents. If you may allow me, that uh, no question that in, the, uh, in our country also uh, biological control in greenhouse conditions are working perfectly with all of the new technologies, in, uh, for instance, in the tomato and, uh, and pepper grown uh, greenhouses. They use biological control. And this is very popular, actually. And this is also environmentally safe technology. And I'm sure that this is, and personally, I'm not a soil scientist at all, but I'm always amazed at how how a soil can dry out completely and a month later when enough water came in the system, the so-called fertility of the soil still in flower. It's enormous possibility in the soil. So you, you have to think on that. I'm sure that in the, the, let's say the, the soil conditions are very important. And uh, UNESCO had a, a very nice program, the Mirzen. It's almost a 60-year uh, project. And the Mirzen project was using mi microbiological systems in uh, soil on the symbiosis. They uh, introduced uh, different rhizobia in, uh, in developing countries, especially in Africa. They had selected very nice rhizobia strain uh, active in nitrogen fixation in, in in vitro condition. When they use it in the soil uh, treatment of certain crop in, in Africa, unfortunately, the wild type of rhizobia overgrown the, the strain which came from in vitro culture, which actually had much higher nitrogen fixing activity than the wild type. So it was a, a nice initiative, but still you have to use, let's say, every year the rhizobia uh, treatment of the soil or the plant to keep going on. And there are a lot of country using this. So it's, yeah, we are not considering that the biological type of soil fertility can be increased by supporting the symbiosis on, of different crops. Thank you. Uh, some other comment? Professor Andras Baldi, also the member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Thank you, and uh, uh, my name is Andras Baldi. My background is biodiversity research, and I have to congratulate for the report and for this roundtable discussion, which is more exciting than usual discussions and it's nice to see the different points of view. As I said, I'm 
my background is biodiversity research, so I have to comment on the relation of agriculture and biodiversity. First of all, it it's, used to be an extremely positive relationship for centuries, but uh, in the last 50, 70 years, when agriculture became more industrialized and large scale and intensive applying uh, chemicals, usually without limit, all this contributed to the decline of biological diversity. And globally, in Europe, in Hungary, we have the common bird census and we can easily see that in the last <coughs> two decades, almost 40% of the farmland birds disappeared while the use of pesticides more than doubled. And there are not only correlative but other experimental and, and, and an extreme amount of evidence on the consequences, on the ne negative consequences of intensive agriculture on, on the biological diversity. Uh, I'm not an agriculture expert, so I have a question re relating the IPM, which seems to be well known and applied already for many decades, <coughs> but why is not more widespread across Europe? Why it not used widely? Why is you know just a tiny portion of agriculture? So why not agriculture developing better to integrate uh, natural processes and and let's say ecosystem services? So how how you see what how 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 how, how this recent situation can be changed toward a, a win-win situation when there is production and the environment is not harmed? Professor Norton, the mic. Well, precisely, this is the central question. Um, and in the literature we reviewed, there is ample literature showing that when there are concentrated programs to support and, and uh, encourage IPM, whether it's rice cultivation or, or American um, wheat and, and uh, soybeans, then the programs can achieve very impressive results. They can actually match or in some cases improve the previous yields before the introduction of IPM. And, um, and they also are associated with dr dr drastic reduction in the use of chemicals. Um, but the general historical literature says that once those specific programs have, uh, have matured, and most of them are you know, time limited or resource limited, then uh, the, uh, um, a large number of farmers go back to the basic uh, reliance on commercial advice and commercial knowledge, which of course it depends entirely on chemical control. So you get, as long as you can focus resources and support and encouragement and education and probably some grants on farmers, then this can be an effective mechanism. But you've removed that and that you move to the sort of bottom line, which is that you then have farmers relying on the commercial provision of, of crop protection products, which of course is based entirely on selling uh, the chemicals as the primary means of doing business and therefore providing the, the support for the farmers then. So the key challenge for the commission is how how do you support member, st member states in actually integrating those special uh, projects into the mainstream of agriculture? And uh, our colleagues um, mentioned there's nothing new about IPM. Uh, IPM is, is widely accepted as a, as a desirable principle. But when the, co when the commission did surveys on what was actually happening, they found that it was still the, the it still requires some degree of dedication by the farmer to decide to do it for other reasons, uh, principles or for environment or other. And it was not uh, spreading to become like the uh, basic assumption of how you do agriculture in each country. And the current proposal of the regulation is to try and change that. It's not to, it's not to reduce farmers' income. It's not to reduce farmers' yield. It's not to render European agriculture uncompetitive with other countries. It's to actually achieve the multiple objectives of efficient, productive, and profitable agriculture, which does not have the same negative effects on the environment and on the wider uh, objectives for society of, of, of better biodiversity in, in the EU. So it's really 
it really a call for all the different viewpoints, all the different expertise to come together towards this common aim and not to argue amongst themselves that um, the, this particular method is either idealistic or naive or, or threatens the future of, of European agriculture's competitors. It's to try and pull together all the expertise from conventional agriculture to, to ecological studies into a, a system which actually is more, more effective. And um, that's what we were trying to help with that process in, in our report. I mean, we don't claim to be experts in, far, in farming in, in every country. We, we just are citing, looking at what the evidence in the published literature can provide uh, towards this overall object, objective. But it does require calling on every expertise. It requires asking companies to move from a business model which is based on maximizing sales of chemicals to a business model which is providing integrated services to farmers to allow them to achieve these multiple societal and their own productive uh, 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 objectives. And some uh, of the pesticide companies have actually su suggested that that is going to be one of their you know, evolution in their business model. And so again, it's a quite trying to integrate the expertise and resources available to this common objective, which I think most people share, is that uh, maintaining food production uh, while trying to minimize um, the um, negative side effects. Thank you. Any other question? Oh, yes, please. Uh, Andras, if, if I can answer for your first uh, point on the biodiversity. Unfortunately, this is true, because what a farmer is doing or an agriculturist, an agronomist, cleaning a plate, a, 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 a part of the, of the soil, eliminating all of the crops and planting only a single one. So it's immediately, it is that you, you lose the biodiversity because you are having a single crop instead of a wide range of different kinds of plants in, in place. But unfortunately, this is how the agriculture is, is working. Now there are some movement actually in more on, on the small farmers that they are diversifying the crops and not only planting one single crop, however, planting more in, in the same field. And in that ter terms, it's increasing the biodiversity a little bit, but it's still an agriculture field. So it is very difficult to compare the biodiversity in that sense. I have a, uh, read a very nice article uh, published by a group from Lyon and what they did, they was looking for antibiotic, uh, antibiotic resistance in different soil. And what they find that in a prairie land in US, never used in agriculture, back 100 years. So it's so-called untouched region from the human intervention or interaction. And compared the, the, the flora, the microbiome, uh, with a regularly agriculturally used land in another place. And what they find, that the antibiotic resistance genes, it's much higher in the prairie land than in the agriculture field. And this makes sense because the, the biodiversity is completely different. It's the biodiversity in the agriculture land is very poor compared to the natural ecosystem. But this is what we unfortunately can't do anything on that if we would like to have uh, at least agriculture in place uh, for producing, let's say, food enough in good quality and, and so on. Please. In relation to this last uh, topic, I would like to point out that just one year ago, the Environment Panel launched in this very room another report on the regenerative agriculture in Europe, which was arguing against what you are saying now, that it's possible also in agricultural landscape to increase the biological diversity and, and do that in farming. 
And, and uh, I think you should combine these two reports, the one, one year back and, and the present report. And, and none of them are against all use of chemicals, for instance, or only arguing for organic farming or anything like that. They are accepting what we have, but, but they are arguing that we have to be sustainable, and they're using also the arguments again, which was raised earlier, that we have effects here also on the climate releases and so on, the carbon dioxide re release and so on. So I think you should combine the two reports and, and use them in relation to agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. The lady. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I would like to reflect to two points, actually, in the meantime. First, I w wanted to answer your question, but then I would like to refer uh, or respond to this um, issue of, of, of biodiversity uh, raised by Ermin uh, Balaj. Uh, I fully agree. And I, for to this, I would just say that I do agree that the very, at, in the very heart of the ecological contradiction is monoculture. And I have no solution to that, but yeah, that is the problem. And if we have a problem and it's severe enough, we have to mitigate that. And that is just for the, for the biodiversity issue. As for integrated pest management, uh, your question, Andras, uh, assumed that there is one integrated pest management, that we know what pest man integrated pest management is. And I'm afraid that is far not the case. So there are the, the, the strategies, the, uh, the initiatives within or disciplines in um, integrative, uh, integrated pest management, of which only two is related to reduction of chemical pesticides. And uh, um, I think a main drawback here is exactly this, that integrated pest management is not defined. We don't know what we are talk when we, when we, what we refer to, what entity we refer to exactly when we say integrated pest management. We are, we can refer to the, to the main strategy, but to what extent is always questionable. And even in, in this dispute is an issue that um, seed dressing could not be considered as a part of integrated pest management, and that shouldn't be a question. Still, it has to be repeated in, in, the, in the report. So there is no, a, a main advantage of organic agriculture, ecological agriculture, is that they could define themselves very well with simple way, by the way, biased way, I assume, because the, 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 the definition, the ban on synthetic pesticides is not a justified one. In fact, there was a paper uh, recently claiming that there are assumptions about uh, the health benefits of, of ecological agriculture on humans. One is that there is a lower pesticide residue level in organic agriculture than in, than in industrial agriculture. Uh, uh, and the other is that this results in a better health status of those consuming organic products. And then what we can say is that both are true, but the connection between the two is not proven because it's not necessarily the, the, the pesticide residues that are causing the health problems and also consumers may have their lifestyle or their, or their attitude which is responsible for the better, or consciousness which is better, uh, responsible for the better um, health status. So, but still organic agriculture is very well defined. We don't use pesticides and then it's a very simple message. So integrated pest management is far not as described it's not a product category. The consumer doesn't does have no knowledge about it at all. It's for the agricultural profession to use. And that, is, that could be also a, a way out to have it better defined and also have it more transparent to society. Uh, maybe that would be a way ahead. 
So I give you the chance, and that will be, I, I am afraid, the last question, because we are already exceeding our time frame, but please. Yeah, uh, just to refer to, is there no alternative to monocultures? Uh, there surely is. In the Netherlands, we are the second biggest exporter of food in, after the United States. Uh, we do a lot of um, research, and actually, I think Wageningen University was at the basis of the Green Revolution, with all its side effects, negative side effects at the moment. Um, and what we, what we do now at Wageningen University is also a lot of research on farms of the future, where large monocultures are being replaced by strip cropping, where you actually use again that system approach where you see that neighboring plants, neighboring crops actually can be of big influence of one another. They're also of influence on the microbiome. Again, the microbiome is of influence on the plant on the second trophic level, third and fourth on. So, so there's a lot of interesting studies showing that even the yield is higher in strip cropping. Uh, of course, the machinery has to be changed, etc. There is investments that are needed, but even, you know, even something like strip cropping in a very industrial way of production is already a, an enhancement of biodiversity. So it's it's not going back to sort of old times, you know, with nice little, nice little farms and they do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. No, 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 that's not the case. We're going to change agricultural systems with satellites, with robots, uh, with a lot of new technologies, but we're going to come to a point where at the landscape level, at the crop level, at the genetic level, we're all going to use variation to make it more of a system approach. That is where the future is. So I have great hopes. I think it's an excellent report because the problem is, of course, that everybody advising a farmer has something to sell. We used to have independent advisors and we got rid of them. We said we leave it to the market. So that's a problem. We also see in our healthcare the similar thing, where you want to prevent that you get sick rather than a pharmaceutical company actually gets a lot of money out of, you know, selling the pills. So it, it, it's a very analogous situation. So I have big hopes because I see a, young of, a lot of the young people that really want to work on this. So uh, thanks for the, for the great report and everybody that worked on it. Thank you. Any comment? If not, that I would like to thank for all participants this very interesting debate. After this discussion, I ask Professor Wallo, then Professor Kostolanyi, to give your concluding remarks. Please, uh, the microphone first. Well, it's not easy to conclude. Uh, we have different opinions, and the different opinions have been expressed. But I'm, as chair of the environment panel, I'm happy with the report. And as I was also one year ago for the previous report, and I think that we are at least entering into a discussion which is fruitful, and I hope that we can, in the future, agree on some of the basic principles here. For us, it's important in the environment panel, it's important that this will be taken up seriously in the EU system, and I believe it will, and, and uh, we have already been in contact with some of the EU bodies on the topics of this report, and I hope that it will uh, be used for the benefit of both the environment and the agriculture in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, do not expect me to conclude. As I told you in the beginning, I am not an expert. And I don't want to go back to my uh, speech in the opening. It is a real complex issue, like the whole ecosystem, like the entire universe. But I want back, I, I will back to my uh, quite unofficial uh, mention in the welcome dinner in Monday night. I was speaking about my congenital optimism. 
And uh, I think uh, I had a, a surrealistic feeling now. If we were uh, an algorithm, these 30 people, 40 people, an uh, algorithm unit, surely we could uh, get a conclusion, like a machine learning conclusion. But why I am optimistic that we are human beings, and I felt in every uh, opinion who was speaking the last two years a moral responsibility but is override any machine learning, any algorithm unit. The human people, people have a moral responsibility and even it is conclude, uh, uh, conclude, uh, conclusion is almost impossible some uh, specific uh, feature, it is override the machine learning and the algorithm. That is why I am optimistic. And uh, I recommend you to keep your optimism also. And thank you very much for constructing this uh, paper. Thank you for the ESAC expert coming to Hungary, to Budapest, and it is the Thanks for enjoying this uh, very exciting two hours discussion. Thank you very much. At the end of the session, I would like to thanks, thank you the participation of all speakers and presenters and commenters, as well as the attention of the audience. Unfortunately, there were no questions from the YouTube chat, but anyhow. Last but not least, note that the full event will be available shortly on the YouTube channel of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And also, you would be welcome for the lunch, what will be served in the club of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences downstairs in the Vörösmarté room. Goodbye. Thanks. <laughs>